So, hello, good afternoon. Welcome to my uh, session, DEC Pool Server Admin. Um, it's an admin module, so kind of the subtitle gives it away what it is, right? Uh, to manage DEC Pool Server databases directly, so without intervenors of the REST API and uh, stuff like that. My name is uh, Ben Valens. I'm a uh, Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. Uh, I work for a Dutch consulting company called Conditio, and you can find me uh, almost anywhere with my handle, Begelens. Um, to do Gail some, some, <laughs> some favors, uh, who's using DSC? Wow. Is it, is it more than you expected, Gail? It got two arms. It got two arms? <laughs> so, so my promise to you, right, this is the, the, the new type of slide we put in. Uh, my promise, what you will learn from this session is how to make use of this uh, PowerShell module, which I created. Uh, uh, to manage pool servers, well, their databases. Uh, understand why you want to make use of this module instead of uh, the REST API, and uh, maybe uh, you'll be able to migrate some data over from one database type into another. That's kind of the takeaways from this session. So with the agenda, I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit what it is, uh, why did I start doing this, uh, so a little background story just to set some uh, grounds. How does it support all these database types without really zooming into the code too much? But uh, from that moment on, it will be demos until the end. And then we have the, the other slides with the questions and stuff like that. So what is it? It's a module capable of handling uh, all the interactions with DEC pool server databases. So we got MDB databases, which were of the old days, right? So the first pool service day had the MDB database. Uh, EDB databases, which were introduced later on in Windows Server Core, where we had the ECNT provider. Uh, I think EDB is also used for stuff like Exchange and DHCP and stuff like that. And nowadays, with Server 1803 and 2019, we got uh, SQL support for the pool server as well. So we got three kind of database types, and we want to uh, interact with those directly. It's a cross-platform PowerShell module, so you can run this on Linux as well. Uh, it's published on the gallery, so just install module DC Pool Server Admin and you, you get it. Uh, it's also a project on GitHub. Uh, you can go to this link. Uh, if you find any issues or have some additional suggestions or maybe you want to contribute some code, uh, thank you, Gail. Um, that's, that's where you should go. It's MIT licensed, so if you want to make it your own, you can fork it and, and, and do whatever. But, uh, so yeah, why did I start doing this? Well, it started back in 2007, uh, 2017, sorry, uh, where a customer of mine was using EDB uh, pool server databases, uh, and, and they uh, had the issue that things really slowed down, right? And it turns out that database size was just too, too large. So uh, a lot of reporting data was in there, and uh, it's not really accessible. It was not deletable through the REST API. So we, we needed to figure out a way to get into that database and clean things up. And this was before the cyclic uh, manageability thing that they introduced later on in the pool server settings. So I was targeting EDB interact uh, interaction for the maintenance tasks. Uh, and, and the main thing I already said was, was removing all reporting data, but also uh, getting data out of the EDB, like uh, which nodes do I actually manage? Because that's not really obvious from the pool server, right? So uh, I have, I think I have a thousand nodes in my database, but uh, I'm really not sure. There's no way uh, for me to properly expose that through the REST API. And also, I wanted to do things like within Azure Automation DEC uh, to change the configuration name on the server instead of the client. So without doing a re-registration, just go into the database, say, hey, uh, from now on, you're not uh, uh, using the base configuration anymore. You are now a proper web server, something like that. And I wanted to learn to code uh, commandlets in C-sharp, so it was also kind of a pet project for that. But then Microsoft introduced SQL support in uh, Server 1803 and Server 2019. And uh, I wanted to make the, the, the bar a little bit less high for other people to contribute. So I, I moved everything to a script module. So it's easier for external contributors. Uh, and I, I really needed this to get my customers off of EDB and into SQL. So kind of have a migration scenario. So how does it support all these database types? So there's a bunch of caveats involved with a certain database type and a certain uh, OS you are running on, and a certain PowerShell type you are running. So MDB only works on Windows PowerShell, 
so no partial core, uh, because it requires this type that's not available in core. So it's the OLEDB uh, connection uh, type. Uh, and an additional installation needs to happen as well. So you need to install the uh, Access Database Engine, the 64-bit version, because I don't want you to drop to 232-bit PowerShell just to access, uh, access databases. Uh, if you don't have these uh, requirements, the module will guide you uh, properly, and it will show you, hey, you should use Windows PowerShell, and if you don't have the database engine installed, it will tell you where to fetch it. So EDB works on uh, Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 6, but as long as stuff is running on Windows. Uh, the reason for that is because the ESNT uh, interop API DLL is shipped as part of Windows. So it's, it's not available on Linux. <laughs> and for SQL, we uh, require the SQL client, uh, and the SQL client is, as far as I know, uh, part of PowerShell itself, uh, at least it's shipped with, uh, with PowerShell. Um, so that, that's the part that's cross-platform. So as soon as you're onto a SQL platform, uh, then you'll do fine well, whatever the, uh, the client you're using. So, and that, that was the last slide, so uh, demo time. So, uh, to set some grounds, I have a demo environment here uh, consisting of two servers running in Azure, and luckily uh, the uh, Wi-Fi is doing good. Uh, but if anything breaks, blame Yap, right? Blame Yap. So, I got a, a pool server here and another machine that is a, a, an LCM, so that's the client node, so to say. Uh, and this pool server is actually uh, running two pool servers. Uh, I got two pool servers installed. One is running, it's an EDB pool server. You kind of can guess what kind of database that one has. Uh, and the other one is a SQL pool server. Uh, the reason I'm using AppCMD is because I'm, I'm running PowerShell Core on, on top of this uh, Windows Server 2019. And the uh, web administration module is not compatible. So. Just to be absolutely sure that the application pool and stuff is also started, I'm just going to run this. So we now have a live and active EDB-based pool server. And I'm going to onboard uh, this node, this LCM node. So and to do that, uh, because both are in the same network, I can just say, OK, I, I trust everything. There's bad practice, but for demo purposes, it's fine, right? And hopefully, I get a session and I get it. So thank you, Yap. So uh, just to show you, this is an out-of-box experience. This LCM has never been configured before. We can see a kind of a, a clean slate, right? So. so what we'll do now is we will onboard this, this, this node uh, by specifying this configuration, which will generate a metamorph. Uh, it knows how to do that because of the DC local configuration manager attribute on top. And we configure the uh, configuration repository to point to that pool server uh, using this, this predefined registration key. And again, for demo purposes, everything is, of, of course, unsecure. So just to make it easy for me. So let's just run that and see the magic happen. Hopefully. <laughs> The note did double registration, so it, it registered the configuration side and it registered the uh, reporting side. So I'm going to exit that session for the LCM, and, and the first thing I'm going to do now is just query the REST APIs. And by the way, hopefully people in the back, they can read the code. Yeah, fine, good, awesome. So to uh, query the REST API, you, you, well, you need the, the FQDN. In this case, it's the local machine, so local host uh, is, is sufficient, right? I'm targeting the, the port where it's, uh, it's hosted. And I have this PSDEC pool server uh, as, as the appended route. So I kind of need to tell the uh, uh, pool server I'm, I'm using protocol version 2. This is expected by the pool server. Uh, so I'm just going to put this uh, hash table into memory so I can have some uh, arguments splatted against invoke REST method. And by running this, I'm going to enumerate the routes, uh, which, which the REST API should expose, right? But don't be fooled. Many of these routes are not actually implemented or halfly baked. So the, the REST API is, is basically only there to serve the LCM's needs and not really to serve your administrative needs. But we'll see that in a little bit, uh, what the limitations are. So to ask the pool server for a node object, you need to provide the uh, URI uh, you're sending to the pool server with the agent ID of the node. To, f to get the agent ID of the node, you need to go to, into the node and say, hey, what's, what's your agent ID? 
if you're in a segregated network, that kind of does not work anymore, right? So, so you have an LCN that's capable of calling into the pool server because you allowed port 443 outbound. But the other way around, that's, that's not doable uh, for, for some reason. And, and in that uh, sense, you'll be uh, uh, caught into a situation where you need to have some kind of shadow administration. So if you have like a thousand nodes you're managing in a segregated network uh, with a single pool server, you kind of need to define those agent IDs somewhere so you know uh, what to ask the, the REST API uh, to return. So in this case, I am capable of, of talking to that LCM. So what I'm going to do is just invoking this, this script block and asking uh, the local configuration manager for its agent ID and then just storing that in the agent ID variable. And now you can see what, what I meant with every call you do to the uh, REST API of the pool server requires that agent ID to be present in the URI. So if we look at how the URI is now uh, formatted, we can see the, the, uh, the GUID of the agent ID is actually part of it. So let's ask the pool server for uh, the node object, and, and it will return it uh, as, as, as requested. So we can see a couple of things here, like uh, the LCM version, the node name, uh, some of the IP addresses and stuff like that. Uh, there's no configuration names assigned and, and uh, a bunch of internal details as well. So how do we get reports out of that uh, pool server? Well, we just add on slash reports. Let's do that. And then we uh, ask the pool server to return the, the reports. Well, now imagine your pool server is running for a year or something like that. And this, the LCM, was kind of the first node you onboarded. There's not really a way for me to say, hey, uh, uh, REST API of the pool server, please provide me with the, all the reports from the last uh, two hours or something like that. Something useful, right? So you, you just you ask it to give you reports, and it will uh, provide you with all the reports it knows about. <clears throat> so this is the, the first one. Uh, this, this note was just onboarded, so the, the amount of reports is not that many. Uh, reports. So there's only two. So in this case, it's not, it's not really a useful example. But uh, imagine like we're a year uh, uh, in the future, right? And, and considering this node has been onboarded and it's, it's been active like for five minutes already, sent two reports, multiply that, and you, you get a big number, right? And um, uh, the data that gets returned uh, by this pool server is, is, has got some nested serialization, so you need to do some work actually to uh, parse that data and, and make it a little bit more useful. So how do we say, uh, hey, node, you should now pool uh, another MOF file without going to that node and doing the re-registration there? So we, we can do the registration against the REST API ourselves. Uh, the thing we need is the registration key, which is defined here in this, this file. And we uh, uh, provide that as a, a base64 encoded uh, string in, within this uh, basic authorization header. And let's just minimize it so I can easily select it. Oops. Hopefully. Then we need to provide it with some, some body. Uh, and the body is basically the same as the node object. It was returned to us uh, with the previous get call. But we need to strip out some of the information. Uh, like the OData, metadata, it will trip upon that. If that's part of the, the object you send in, it will, uh, it will fail. Uh, next thing what we want to do is, of course, assign it a configuration. So we're assigning the configuration psconfu, for you. And we're saying, OK, uh, we need to define the uh, registration type we're using. So it's a configuration repository. There's two other configuration types uh, you, can, uh, you can give it. Uh, I think it's the... Uh, report uh, repository and the resource repository. If you specify those, then the re-registration will not take the uh, configuration names. So just to see how the node object looks now, we can see we have defined the configuration names, but this is just all locally. So now we're going to do uh, a put against the REST API and pass it that body uh, converted to JSON. And if we check the API again, now we can see from the pool server end uh, that the psconf EU uh, configuration was assigned. Now let's reset that to, to null because uh, we, uh, we want the rest of the demos to work as well. 
It's just to show you the interactions with the, with the REST API, right? So I, I kind of have some reminders here, uh, and I, I hope I convey that it's inflexible, uh, not administrator friendly, and it, it requires uh, a lot of work for, for you uh, if you want to do it properly uh, with ad shadow administration probably uh, being necessary. So for now, let's, let's kill that pool server for a bit and move to the second part of the demo. Because I, I told you uh, the DC pool server admin uh, module also works with MDB files. Turns out uh, working with MDB files in a pool server nowadays is, is pretty difficult to set up because uh, uh, every resource that helps you uh, to define a pool server basically skips over the fact that it's still a possibility. So you need to define an EDB one and then go into the web config, change a bunch of stuff, install additional dependencies, and then you maybe end up with an MDB. So what I did uh, is I pre-staged this stuff, and I got the devices MDB already inside of this, uh, this uh, project file. So this stuff runs only on Windows PowerShell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a local session. Uh, so I have uh, a nested uh, session here. And as you can see in the bottom here, I'm uh, now connected to the local host PowerShell 5.1 session. And I already installed the module just to, to keep you from seeing download screens, right? So DC pool server admin, it uh, got a bunch of commands. But basically, uh, what, 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 you, what you will find is that uh, only the connection command is, is basically uh, telling which database type you're going to use, and all the other functions uh, have abstracted away uh, which database is being used. So the API search for the, for the user experience for the end user is the same no matter what database type you're using. So we can see a bunch of commands like the get, uh, get DC pool server admin device. So this was the, the DC v1 device registration, so the, the, the PowerShell uh, WMF v4 uh, LCMs. Uh, admin registration, so those are the nodes objects, uh, status reports, uh, and we got gets, news, remove, and set, right? So we can manipulate, remove, uh, or create new data if we want to. And this works against all those databases. So MDB, EDB, and SQL uh, are fully supported in every regard. So let's create a connection to that MD MDB file that's in the uh, repository. <clears throat> so what actually the connection does uh, as well is it, it sees, okay, so this is an MDB. I'm going to open up the MDB, going to look for the required tables. Uh, if this uh, MDB file doesn't look like a, a pool server database, I'm going to yell at you in red that it's probably not the, the, uh, the file you want to use, right? So I created this, this connection, and this connection is the, the active connection. So uh, every new command I'm going to run is going to assume this connection is, is the, the target connection. But you are allowed to stack up additional connections, uh, but the, the next connection you put in uh, of this stack will not be the uh, active one. You can set it active later on, but uh, yeah, it, it gives you some, some, some means of flexibility to work with different databases at the same time. So let's just see if a, a, a registration is in this MDB file. So without specifying uh, any agent ID, I just now said, hey, uh, database, give me all the node objects you know about. There's, there is only one, but, uh, but uh, I, I did not have to do anything to get it, right? Just give me the admin registrations. So we can see uh, a VM02 was onboarded into this MDB pool server with this agent ID, and it, it had this my super server uh, configuration name, right? And I can also uh, specify node names. Well, just just uh, remind you that a node name is not a key for LCMs. Uh, the agent ID is the is the the key that makes it unique. You could have multiple nodes with the same name uh, in a pool server. So uh, if you really want to be explicit which node object you want. Uh, first be sure to, again, get the, the agent ID you want. But now you can inspect the database for the agent ID instead of going to the LCM. Uh, we can also do the similar things with, uh, with, uh, sorry, with status reports. So I just ask it, give me all the status reports uh, without, any, uh, other uh, uh, without any other parameter defined. I can define a, a bunch of parameters. I've got some examples here. Uh, which I won't go into too much detail, but I can, for example, say, give me all the local configuration manager uh, reports uh, with a start time from now uh, minus two hours. So by default, it, run, it will run in top mode because if you have a thousand reports in it and it, it, you will wait for a thousand reports to be 
put out uh, to your screen. It's, it's a long time uh, wait, right? So by default, it will say, I top it off to five. You can define the top. So you can say, I want 10, I want 20. Or you can say, give me all. So there's an all switch. So uh, that's something you could do. Uh, and something else which you could do is, is remove items that are older than seven days uh, without uh, uh, defining which agent uh, you want to re uh, delete it from. And just, I want to do some, some maintenance on this database. Uh, so the operation type all, there are different operation types. All is kind of the, the catch-all, of course. And you can say uh, to this start time, which is seven days ago, give me all of those and pipe that to remove uh, with a confirm false. So th that will get rid of all the uh, status reports that, that are seven days or older. Try that using the pool server REST API. It's kind of the thing. That's, that's, that's not something you probably uh, will achieve. So we can also set data. Uh, let me shift that into some more lines. So we can say uh, get the EC pool server admin registration with that node name and pipe it to set and specify uh, another configuration name. So we have a what if support. So it will print out in the what if what it will do. It will say, I'm, I'm going to do an update to this device's MDB. Uh, and I will do the uh, update on the registration data table uh, with this configuration name. And the uh, agent ID is the, is the key that's being targeted, right? So it, it will provide all that information uh, for you. If you don't specify what if, it, of course, thinks that uh, you need to confirm this because this, this is an impactful change, right? So the confirm impact is high, and it will, it will ask you to confirm that. So the way to override this is with a confirm uh, false binding. And now we can see this uh, uh, VM02, which is sitting inside of the MDB, has been updated with the configuration name PSConfU. So we can also create new registration data. Why do you want to do that? Well, for example, if you want to move data out of database type A and move it into database type B, um, which is something uh, I will show you a little bit later on. Uh, there's also this use case for, for example, with a, a PowerShell-based pool server, which I'm talking about next Thursday, which will make use of this command to actually do the registration inside of whatever database you're providing it. So we can say uh, with this grid, with this LCM version, with this node name, with this IP address, and just please create this, this data. So no confirm impact here. New data is, is not really an impactful change, right? It's just something we expect to happen. So we see now we have uh, psconfu01 in there as well. If we remove the node name parameter, we can see the list, the list all, hopefully. I removed a character, too many. So now you can see we got uh, both the VM2 and the psconfu01 uh, sitting inside of this MDB. And we can also remove data, but in this case, remove data, of course, is an impactful change. So we have confirm impact, we have what if support, uh, all that good stuff that's, that's baked in. So it ask, it's asking me, are you sure we're going to delete data from this MDB? Yes, I am. It's happened. I do a list all again and it's gone, right? So we can also copy data in from MDB to EDB, or from EDB to MDB, or from MDB to SQL, or from MDB to EDB to SQL, or from SQL to back to MDB. We, we can do all those kind of different interactions uh, using this module. Um, so currently, I have this active connection, as I already mentioned, uh, which is a connection to that device's MDB. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to store that one in the MDB connection variable. So I can define a new connection to this EDB-based EDB database. So this pool server we just used, or this pool server database we just used to onboard that uh, LCM node, right? So let's create that connection as well. And as you can see, we now also have a, a connection to that EDB file. And now we can say, uh, copy the data uh, from connection one, which is the MDB connection, to connection two, which is the EDB connection, and we want to migrate uh, objects uh, of type registration data. There's three types of objects you can migrate. There's also devices and status reports. Uh, but in this case, we're only interested in uh, registration data. So we can give it the what if, and it will say to you, OK, so if we're moving data from this database to that database, a new registration in this case will be created uh, uh, with this agent ID on uh, the EDB, right? So let's, let's do that. 
and we just migrated a node from an MDB to an EDB. This also works the other way around, as already mentioned. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm pointing out uh, verbose. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, query information in here, so if you want to know how stuff actually works under the covers, uh, verbose will give you all the information, as well as the, the what-if stuff. Uh, and there's this, uh, if I find it, there is this warning. It's unable to replace uh, a registration uh, because uh, a force width was not used. So if a conflict is, 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 uh, is detected, it, it does not override it, it does not fail, it will print out a warning. Uh, you can go in and investigate, uh, but probably if, if there's a node already inside of the other database, uh, it's not something you want to blindly override. So if everything works out correctly, we now have, in this case, in the MDB, two nodes, so the WSLCM, which was onboarded inside of the EDB-based pool server, is now also inside this MDB file, and uh, the other way around as well, right? So the VM02, which was inside of the MDB only, is now also inside of the EDB. So let's start that pool server again and see if actually that VM02 uh, is, is, is available through the REST API. So can you still query the REST API, or Ben, did you screw up and, and broke our database? So I, I did a lot of trial and error and, and, and to figure out that stuff actually works. So uh, hopefully, no, not hopefully, this will work. Um, I can just ask that pool server now, which, which is now live again, using that EDB file, give me the VM2 now. And, and as you can see, uh, node name VM02, which we did not onboard into this pool server, but is now capable of talking to this pool server. So I just migrated from MDB to EDB. That, that's pretty nice, right? So let's exit the PowerShell 5.1 session and move to the next part of the demo, um, which is more targeted at EDB interactions. But uh, so, so just FYI, I am back on PowerShell core, running on this Windows Server 2019 machine. Everybody should do that. Uh, a little follow-up that uh, the MDB interaction is not available on PowerShell core. So this is, this is one of the caveats I mentioned inside of the slides, right? If I'm targeting that uh, MDB now, we can see the old EDB connection is not available. So it, ki it kindly asks you in red to move over to Windows PowerShell if you want to make use of this functionality. And if you did not install that access database, it will also kindly request you in red to install it and fetch it on this URI. So it's, it's pretty helpful like that. So where is the EDB located? We already actually saw that, but uh, we could investigate the web config file, right? So we can see C pool server devices EDB. Let's create a connection to it uh, now in this other PowerShell 6 session. And I'm just waiting it for, to, to error out. So don't be alarmed, this is a staged error. Uh, so it, it mentions that the database is locked. Uh, and, the, and the reason it's locked is because the pool server is up. So the, the, the main issue with EDB is that when you use EDB and you want to manipulate data inside of the, uh, inside of the EDB, uh, you need to schedule downtime because you can only do that when the pool server is down. That's probably not a situation you want to be in. So my suggestion is to stop it once, move everything to SQL, and be done with it, right? So just to get around this, let's, let's stop that pool server for a minute. And see that if we try again, we now get a connection. And sure, we went inside of that EDB file. We checked for the tables in there. Uh, it contains all the tables we, we, uh, we, we find that are necessary to make it a, a, a DC pool server database, right? And again, just the same as with the MDB interactions, we can just say get DC pool server admin registration, and we, we get everything out of there. So what I want to do now is, is create a configuration. And as you can see, this WSLCM we onboarded does not have a configuration assigned currently. But we want to assign it server side. So by manipulating the database, we don't need to go to the node again uh, to update its, its meta configuration. We can just do the manipulation inside of the database uh, and have the node converge automatically, just like within Azure Automation DSC. So uh, we have this really simple uh, configuration, psconfu. Uh, which will create just a file uh, stating the obvious, right? I, I think everybody can agree. So let's put that in memory so we can actually compile it, put it in our configuration directory, and attach the uh, uh, associated checksum file, so the, 
Pulsar actually knows that, that uh, a change was made. So what we want to do now is we want to update that WSLCM node uh, with the configuration name just to config, because that's what we just uh, compiled. This is a, a change. We want to uh, confirm that. And now we can see just the config has been assigned to that node. So let's start the pool server. So the maintenance cycle is over. We can start the pool server again. And, and notice that the module is not blocking for the pool server to start. The module only locks the file when it does a, a, an interaction with the database. And it unlocks it as soon as it's done. Let's move back to that LCM. And just inspect the local configuration manager uh, uh, stuff uh, a little bit first. You can see the configuration names is, is actually empty. So the, the LCM part doesn't know about any change. So this is just how the uh, desired state configuration pool model protocol works. The server is, is the leading part. If you change something there, then the server will check inside of its database what the configuration name for this LCM should be, and it will serve out that sp uh, specific uh, 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 configuration artifact. So let's update and see if it works, right? And hopefully I was in time, so I was in time. Uh, so just a, a file. Uh, I, I did not re-register the node. I just did the database change, and it, it picks up the, the configuration artifact, and uh, it, it did its thing. So if we check the, the content of the file, so then we pro probably see that the obvious is still true. PSCon for you is awesome. Let's access that PS session again. And now we need to kill the pool server again because we want to fetch uh, reports out of the EDB uh, of the type consistency for this specific node name. So we, we can do that, and this is just to, to, to show you how easy uh, still the interaction works. Um, one of the caveats is this does not work on Linux, and I, I'm going to just show you that. So I have WSL installed on this Windows Server machine. Uh, in WSL, I, call, I have PowerShell installed. And as you can see, PowerShell version 6.2.1 on this, uh, on this uh, uh, server. And just, just to assure you that uh, it sees that it's a Unix platform, right? So let's copy in this, uh, this command. Uh, again, DC Pool Server admin module is already pre-installed just to keep you away from uh, in installation screens or progress bars. And we can see here that, OK, uh, to access EDB files, please use uh, PowerShell Windows. So the error messages direct you in the, in the correct way. Right? So unfortunately, ESENT uh, DLL is not shipped in, in Ubuntu. So that leaves us with the SQL interaction part. So um, the UX stays the same. I already uh, mentioned that a couple of times. Uh, currently, the EDB pool server it was stopped, uh, and the SQL pool server is, is also still stopped. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start that SQL pool server. I'm not going to bring that EDB-based pool server up anymore. I think it's time to migrate over. I think it's time to decommission the EDB, right? We, we want to build additional tooling on top of SQL. We want to have nice reporting, stuff like that. And we want to make changes without bringing the pool server down in the future. So where is this SQL pool server looking at for its database? Well, it's looking uh, using this OLEDB provider to the local host. And it's using this uh, SQL login, right? So this is here in clear text. So be sure uh, to govern that a little bit. Let's create a connection. And we, as you can see, the same as with the MDB and EDB, we create the connection relatively easily using that single uh, function. And we can see we have two connections currently uh, uh, stacked up inside of the scope. So we're going to get the um, uh, admin registrations using uh, the specified connection. And by the way, the reason I have the SQL variable defined is because I, I piped it to T object, right? I don't know many guys knows about T object, but it's really nice to just print out to the screen and also capture it in a variable in the, in the same run. So every command also has a connection parameter, also has an MDB uh, path parameter, also has an EDB path parameter. Uh, you, you can do ad hoc connectivity if you want. Uh, but from my experience, just working with the connection objects is, is really the best way to go. 
uh, and you, you don't need to um, uh, really think about if the connection you're using for your gets is used in the sets as well, because that's handled under the covers. So the connection you use for the get is also the one that's used for the set. It's also the one that's used for remove uh, and stuff like that. So currently, this node or this database doesn't have any node object. So let's move back to that LCM session and see if the uh, node is actually capable of talking to this pool server. So we got an expected error. The agent ID is not found. So we, we got a, um, uh, where is it, uh, 400 something? Yeah, resource not found, 404. So that's, that's kind of, hey, stupid. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, aware of what you're talking about. So let's access that LCM session again. And we're going to copy that data from, in this case, the active connection, which is the EDB connection, into the SQL connection, and we're going to migrate the registration data without killing the pool server. So pool server is still up. Now we can see with the get that the WSLCM and the VM02 are actually inside of that database. Uh, so they are available. And if everything worked out correctly, I can now, again, with my LCM, talk to this pool server. Because I just migrated the database in, or the, the data into the SQL database. And that's enough for the pool server to know that, hey, this is a node I know about. No need for a new registration key. I'm just going to serve again. So let's update its configuration, right? Uh, this is just another config, stating again the obvious about in this, this case, in another file. So just because it has a different name, I'm going to be able to show this to you. Uh, I'm going to compile again a MOF file, assign the associated checksum. And in this case, uh, the get of the WSLCM targeted at the SQL connection will be updated with the configuration name, just another config. And I'm adding verbose so you can see uh, this. Oops, oops. So you can see the, all the, the SQL statements that are sent to that pool server database, right? So if we ask for that node object again, we can see just another config was actually uh, uh, applied. Let's move to that uh, LCM, update its configuration, and we see that it now applied a new configuration without bringing the pool server down, just doing a server-side uh, reassignment of its configuration name. And again, stating the obvious. So, this case, uh, SQL uh, in interaction on uh, Linux is uh, actually working, and this makes this uh, this module, in my opinion, uh, cross-platform. <laughs> so, um, let's see that in action. Uh, you already saw the PS version table, so not, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, let's copy over this uh, uh, this line. Yeah, thank you. Observant. People are not asleep. <laughs> so the reason I'm copy-pasting is because when I hit F8 now, it, it sends it to the integrated terminal, but it will wait until Ubuntu is finished. So I, I will kill Ubuntu, and then you'll see the commands coming down. So you need to copy-paste in just because you're nested too much. So let's, let's create that connection. Again, provide that really simple password. The, the reason that it's simple is obvious. I don't want to make demo mistakes. Um, and in this case, from Linux, I can also query that database and get that uh, node data out of it. I can get the report data out of it just as easily. So in this case, everything is uh, cross-platform. And that was the end of the demos. Um, so to summarize, it, DC pool server admin, the module makes it really easy uh, to manage uh, uh, pool server databases, right? Uh, it supports MDB, EDB, and SQL. Uh, just be aware of the caveats, where MDB is only Windows PowerShell together with the database, uh, the access database engine, which is an uh, additional installation. EDB is Windows only, but uh, runs on Windows PowerShell and on PowerShell Core, uh, just because the ECMT DLL is, is available on the Windows platform. And SQL is, is, is just general uh, available uh, everywhere, so it also runs on uh, Linux uh, and Mac OS. Uh, and, and SQL Server, Pool Server, is, is in my opinion, uh, and I think you guys uh, should agree, uh, is the best experience. So, so get all your notes into uh, SQL-based Pool Server. 
That were uh, my slides, my demos. Uh, so if there are questions. No questions? So you can get the slides and the demos uh, already on my GitHub, uh, on my handle Begelens, uh, psconf eu 2019 so because this is my first session. If you go to that GitHub, there's also this README. If you want to uh, walk through this demo environment yourself, there is this nice Deploy to Azure button. It requires you to have an Azure subscription, subscription but you can click this, uh, instantiate the demo environment, follow these little post deployment instructions, and you can step through the, the demos yourself if you like. So, and considering there's no questions uh, uh, about me, so uh, Ben Glens, MVP, uh, Cloud and Data Center Management. Uh, Ben Glens is my handle, and I work for a new startup company in the Netherlands uh, called Conditio. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>